I guess we're on, uh, everybody, to today's Hangout. Today's Hangout is Behind the Curtain, What is a fabri Fabrication Configuration? And this Hangout is brought to you by Applied Software's Construction Technology Group, and we're the premier construction systems integrator in North America. Uh, my name is William Spear, and I just want to thank you all for joining us today. And throughout the presentation, by the way, feel free to interact with us by typing in questions and comments using the question pane. We'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation. And Law, if you want to give me control, then I'll advance the slides. You should have it. Is it not working? No, no, go ahead. You'll, I'll okay. let you do them. I'll let you advance them. <clears throat> you can go ahead and switch to the next one. Oh, okay. There we go. So the webinar is going to be recorded today, and I'll be available to you online as we're presenting. Um, and the web will be available, or the webcast will be available to you online through our YouTube channel. And we'll also send you an email following the webinar uh, with a link to that recording. And if you haven't done so already, go ahead and search Applied Software on Facebook and like our page, and that way you'll receive the latest information and special offers. And when you visit our website, which is ASTI Applied Software Technology Inc. dot com, there's a complete schedule of coming events, webinars, trainings, and more. Um, these are some of the live lab learning things you can find on our website as well. Next slide. Uh, some of the upcoming events we have are include the World of Concrete, which will be February 2 through 5 in Vegas, uh, the Top Sides Convention, which is uh, oil, oil rig convention, that will be February 9th to 11th in Galveston, Texas. And in March 9th to 11th in San Antonio will be the AGC event. That will be at the Grand Hyatt down there. So stop by and see us if you're going to be or interested in coming to any of those. Stop by and see us when you come. If you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me. My contact information is there at the bottom of the screen. All right. <clears throat> Some of the upcoming Hangouts are going to be everything you need to know about Autodesk Fabrication Licensing. And in, in March, we're going to have Mastering Annotations in Fabrication. And feel free to contact me and let me know if there's any uh, Hangout subjects that you're interested in. And if I see a trend or something that you know sparks some interest uh, with us or you or what have you, then we'll be happy to add that to the list. All right, next slide. And at the end of the webinar today, there's going to be a drawing for a $25 gift card. And so we're going to pick one of the questions that are submitted, uh, any of the good questions that are asked, and we'll uh, draw your name for that. You do need to be online to get that. All right, next slide. All right, so today's uh, fabrication hangout topic is going to be what's behind the curtain, uh, what is fabrication configuration. And our presenter today is a technical advisor at Applied Software for the Autodesk Fabrication Products. He has extensive experience in installing, training, and supporting Fabrication CAD MEP, SDMEP, CAMDUCT, Tracker, and Remote Entry. He previously worked as a designer and drafter for an MEP contractor and has contributed significantly towards the creation of applied configuration packs for the U.S. market and our courseware and training materials as well, all those creation efforts. He's also involved with Applied Software's go-to-market strategy for best-known practices, knowledge base for the Autodesk Fabrication Solutions. So please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Lyle Yonda. Lyle, it's all yours. Thanks, William. So let's go ahead and just jump in here. Um, I've got a couple slides and before I jump into the program. So what is a configuration? Uh, Usually what I hear, uh, the configuration and database thrown around as the same when in reality when you look at it and break it out, they are completely separate things. So when we talk about a configuration, we're talking about everything that makes the program work. Item, reports, uh, um, templates, things like that, whereas a database is part of the configuration which hosts everything as far as your materials, connectors, seams, specifications, all the map files that um, make up that configuration. So let's take a look at this a little bit further. 
So here's here's what I'm talking about. So here's the configuration. So you'll see here we uh, we can break it out, and I'll give you some examples of the out of the box and um, a modified configuration. So you'll see here we've got three basic parts: the items, which make up your services, which makes up part of the file in the database that you see on the right. Reports also um, will reside in this configuration folder as well as we can throw in some resource materials, things like uh, templates, CAD blocks, uh, CTB files, and so forth. So and I'll, I'll explain that later as we get into that. And let's go ahead and show you what I'm talking about here. So out of the box, if you browse to your C drive, users, public, public documents, you'll see uh, you have two options when you download the product. You've got the Imperial content and the metric content. So if I take a look at the Imperial content, you'll notice everything in here, and this is what essentially makes up the configuration. Now, we can take this further and break out certain parts of it to uh, make user-specific uh, configurations and or settings and so forth. Um, so if I go to the database folder, here's everything that uh, consists of the database folder. So what I was talking about, like the service.map file, that's going to hold all the information um, as I'm editing services and things like that. So, uh, and then you'll see here the map.ini file. This really is the key uh, component that is telling it, the program what configuration to look at. So I could set up multiple configurations. Uh, so and, I, and I'll give examples on how we can break this out um, to make this be unique for each user. So that way I can have unique uh, printer settings and or text and DIM styles. So let's take a look at that real quick. So if you take a look at uh, one of our configurations, we'll we just put it on our C drive. Um, you'll notice we've broken it out uh, common files and you'll see why here in a sec while we've broken it out to working database and then local settings. So you'll see here I've got a pipe and duct. That allows me to have different DIM and text styles as well as uh, spool settings, uh, printer setups, etc. Uh, in here. So here's some of the files that we can break out um, to make those unique to each user, but still use the same database folder in here uh, to pull your items, reports, all that stuff so that stays the same across the board. So the main thing is when you download and you're uh, modifying your configuration, and I'll say this you know, time and time again, make sure you back up. Whether you're using an outside source to do so, um, it's on the server and your server is getting backed up every so often. It's as simple as coming into, you know, we'll look at the uh, default one. You know, if I've got both of these configurations in here, I may want to come and just grab this Fabrication 16 and zip it up and store it somewhere safe. Um, really the main thing to that you want to grab is you really want to grab everything that consists of the configuration. So if I go look at that modified uh, configuration that we have, I want to make sure that I grab this Autodesk Fabrication folder. So that way it grabs everything in here. If I take a look now at the Edit Configuration dialog, in here, this is where I have control of uh, what I set up. So you'll notice here I've got a working database, ductwork and pipework. Um, again, the main thing that this is looking at is the INI file. So that INI file is telling it to go pull my items, reports, etc., from uh, wherever I'm telling the INI to look at. So if I double click here, Here's one way to come in and modify that INI file. If you're comfortable enough to go into the map.ini, you can modify it in there. And there's certain things in here that I can break out to make it unique. Uh, one being the projects, I can put that essentially anywhere I want. Um, for the CAM guys, I will 
put the CNC folder. I guess I don't have access to it right here, but if I go look at my I and I. You'll see here I can tell that to path anywhere I wish. So this is important when if you're using a database on the server, you want to make sure you point it to the server. Um, and if I'm adding configurations, again I want to go into that edit configuration uh, dialog. When I start the program up I can do it the same way and simply select new, browse out to wherever that INI file is at. So in this instance, I would go to one of the working local settings and for the out-of-the-box Autodesk, simply select this V303 because that's where that INI file is located at and that will pull the information that's needed. I can also remove uh, links in here by just right-click remove or rename uh, whatever the name is that's in here. The out-of-the-box ones, you'll see has a lock. I can't delete them by right-clicking, but again, use with caution. Uh, it's a registry value that you can go in and delete to remove that from your list. Uh, I won't show that again. Use that with caution, um, but you can remove that. So that's one way to add a configuration and in, to it. Another thing to keep in mind also is the product information editor. So when I come in here, so this is part of uh, you know what the configuration is looking at um, to pull the necessary product information. This is important um, really for all products. You really don't want to ignore it, uh, but really SMEP is pulling this information uh, You'll see here every item has a unique ID code assigned to it that is then assigned to uh, whatever supplier you're using. So that's how that's linked up. So again, we want to make sure we don't ignore that. And if you're building items, you want to make sure that you put this information. And I'll show that uh, when you're downloading content from Autodesk. Now, just a warning, if you go, there's some websites uh, I know like Viega, you can go download some content, and I believe Upanor has some items. They do not provide the map prod information. So again, keep that in mind. For CAD, that's fine if you're not using it to report on, but for S, it gets a little hairy. Now, um, if I want to move this configuration to a shared location because you'll notice mine's on my C drive. It's as simple as just copying everything in this fabrication folder and moving it up to uh, to my server and or a cloud-based service uh, Dropbox. That's what we use uh, internally. You'll see here I've got this master database. It's on my Dropbox. Uh, Scott Hendricks, he lives in Las Vegas. I'm here in Austin, so when he makes changes to our database, I simply uh, copy everything down to my local drive. That way I can work outside of the network, um, or if I don't have internet connection, I have all of that information stored on my local drive. So that's copying, and to uh, Autodesk, they have this migration tool. I find that this works best when you're, if you're moving forward from an older configuration, maybe with Map Software uh, had it, it that you, it was the configuration resided in what was called the PM shared. So with the new fabrication uh, file structure, I see that this helps and works best when using the PM shared configuration. If you're using the newer folder file structure, I can just copy that around, add as needed. Um, but I will say with the PM shared type of database configuration, what I find easiest is to create a complete 
blank empty configuration, use the migration tool for it to pull what it can, and then you're going to have to go and copy paste uh, things that it left out because there will be things that it doesn't grab just because it doesn't know where to look for it. So now that I've we've gone over uh, essentially what a configuration is versus the database, you know how can I manage that and how can I use that with the fabrication products? Being that this is a, a single database, uh, you know I can run this across all three products: CAD, CAM, and EST. And so here's you know now we're going to go into kind of how to manage this. And if I'm adding items, uh, what's important to note? If I'm opening jobs that come from other sources and things like that, um, the biggest thing that I see in support that wrecks havoc on uh, databases is opening files that come from uh, outside sources and not knowing what the dial. And I'll show the dialog. Oh, it'll ask you, do you want to use your original database or the working database? So just understanding what that's doing and how that can uh, wreck havoc and or bringing in items from uh, maybe a third party that you don't have those connectors in your database and or the materials, how I can remove that information um, or change it if needed. So if I go ahead and I open up a drawing, this right here, I see this all the time. Uh, users don't read what this is and they just go ahead and start clicking. It is important to understand what I want to do here. So if this is coming from an unknown source and it's outside of uh, my configuration or database, I want to select no. That way when I select no, it will bring in the drawing, but it will still allow me to use my database. And if I go look at those services, you'll notice everything that's tied to those items have a parentheses uh, user group or whatever the name of the drawing is. That's telling me that those items came from this drawing, and as soon as I close out of the program and reopen it, it will remove itself. If I just close the drawing here, it's still in there. So again, if I close and restart, I won't do that just to save some time, um, or I can come in here and purge this out. But before I do so, let me open that drawing back, and if I select yes, you'll notice now it's using the configuration that this was created in and I don't have access to any of this stuff. So again, and I've also seen when you hit yes, it will inject some of this stuff into your database and it can cause, cause a wreck pretty quickly. So open that back up and select no. And I'll look at one of these items. Again, the connectors will all have this uh, parentheses around it, same with uh, services and so forth. So if I close out of that, again, it should, when I close the program, release that information. If not, easy way to come in here and um, purge this stuff out is to the purge icon. So if I fly out my database button and select the yellow P, now back up, back up, back up. Before I do this, again, this is at a, a database administrative level that it's going to come in here and clean this stuff up. And you'll see a list of things in here. I know where that's coming from. I don't know what that is. It probably came in from another item. So I'll go ahead and purge it. Now if I want to make it permanent, I can make it permanent, but I'm going to go ahead and purge it. I'm just going to ask you back up. And that stuff's out of my database now. So again, understanding what that's doing and how um, make sure you back up when pulling before you purge. Um, another thing to keep in mind is creating unique usernames. I know uh, we don't have ours set up just because I've come in here and I test all the time, so I, I don't really need. I want to have full uh, rights to it, but if I go to my configure users.
and this is just the out of the box username and password, passwords admin. I, I want to come in here excuse me, I'm coughing, hold on one second. I want to come in here and create unique usernames and give them the permissions that they need so that way um, again they can only modify what they can modify and um, what you want to give them access to. Now that first prompt that you saw there's nothing in here to uh, change that but if I go back into that edit configuration Academy P, I can set that prompt to always be no. I recommend this especially for uh, you know larger companies that again you've got a CAD user that is just there to draw. He doesn't necessarily know what this stuff is, is going to do if by pressing yes or no so just don't give him the option just so, no. And while I'm in here you can see uh, there's things uh, what I find if you've got costing information you don't want to go out with your drawings check this do not save s tables with DWG database that way they can't grab your costing information on those items um, and two it'll kind of it'll help keep the file sizes down as well next thing is importing services so again it's important to understand how to import a service and um, what that's actually doing. So I went ahead and I've I went to Upanor's website and like I said they've got some services there that I can download. So to do so I will simply type in import SYS. I will browse out to the IEZ file. You'll see here the items um, and the services that are coming over. I'll simply select import. And so this is what's important here. Again, don't just start clicking away. Do you want to import all items or newer? Again, if I select all, it's going to overwrite anything that's in my database that has the same name. So I want to select newer here. Replace all tables or keep existing. I'm going to select keep existing. Again, I, if it finds the same name or something, it's going to overwrite it. It says here it has a service template that's been matched. Click no and a new template will be added. So I'm going to go no to all because, if, again, if I hit yes to all, it's going to override anything. And I, I want to go check that first before, um, before I delete it. So you'll notice that when this comes in, um, again, just understand what it's doing. And typically, I'll purge and make sure everything is out that I want before I start bringing in services. That way, when I come look at my purge, I'll show you show you that in a sec. Well, let's look at this service. So there's that service. And if I edit an item, you'll notice right off the bat. It's got my connectors, everything's in parentheses. Again, I can go through the purge, and this is what I was saying. Purge before you bring in a service, so that way when I come in here, I'll grab the IZ and make permanent. Now, this should make everything permanent that was tied to that IZ. At least that's kind of how my understanding of that is but I have noticed that it doesn't necessarily do that. So then I know all these, everything in here is tied to this service, so I will make it permanent. And now if I look at that item, all that bracketed information has been removed. Now, if I wanted to go one by one, I can right-click on the item, and it would, if it was in bracketed information, it would give me the option to make that permanent.
Now, the same thing when downloading content from the Autodesk website. And let's take a look at we'll take a look at this anvil socket weld. Understand what this is doing. Uh, I can go on the website and download the IEZ file and save it outside of fabrication. Or if I'm doing it through here, I'll simply select download list. And as soon as I hit download, again, it's asking me, this is already exist. I'm going to say note all. And here's that service. Notice that these services that, are, that I'm bringing in, they are not set up, ready to go. I will need to make sure that I add these to a service because, um, again, it's got a button code, but I don't know what that stands for. So make sure you add these to a service and don't just start drawing with these services because you'll be disappointed. So now that I've brought this stuff in here as these services, uh, and I've added them I've added them to the services that I want. I want to go ahead and get this stuff out uh, or delete the service. So in 16, it's nice. They've given me this nice manage button. So I can come in here and delete multiple services. So I'll grab that and I will grab that. I don't need these as in my list. So I'm going to select delete. Now that just deleted it from the list. Now if I want to delete the items and the template and everything that came with it, I need to make sure to go into the service information. Again, that gives me this nice manage. What's nice about this is when I go to manage, you'll see that I've got these templates that have the box. What that's telling me is these templates are not assigned to a service. So I can uh, do as I wish to delete them all. So in this instance, I'll just select delete and I will get those out and they're no longer in my list. So understanding, you know, again, importing things, uh, let me go back to that Autodesk download. Now it should have brought over the product information, but if it doesn't, I want to make sure to check that and then go download it. So I've already done that. Here's what it looks like. And then I will simply add that to my product information. And you'll notice uh, this first A through L is everything in this front part. And then it's given me the supplier information, so I need to go to edit, show suppliers, um, and copy all of that in there. So that way when I report off of it, it will give me the correct information. And what I mean by that is, let me put an elbow, and you'll notice on this Pipework BOM fittings, I'm using the product description. So anything you see with the product and the print object, that's pulling from the map prod. And so that's pulling the description, material, and the manufacturer from my product information. So that allows me to add a description uh, that's different from the item name itself. So if I want to shorten it, lengthen it, do whatever I wish. As far as breaking out the different uh, files to have different uh, user settings. So again, what this is doing here is allowing me to have uh, different DIM and text styles. So if I go look at my main database, take off CAD settings, annotation, all of this information is stored in the CAD info.map file. I can uh, 
like I showed here. Cat info dot map. So I've broken this out to where they're separate, so that way it allows me to have different uh, dimensions or and textiles if needed for uh, whatever discipline um, that allows each user to have some custom uh, information and that's not tied directly to uh, if I make a change of this it's changes for everybody same with the printer setup this allows me to each user can set up their own printers for their reports one user may want to print to PDF one may want to print to the actual printer so this allows me to have that separate for each user by breaking those files out And then same with profiles, if I'm creating profiles, um, if you're breaking it out to each user has it on their local drive, the database administrator just makes sure that, uh, you know, whatever your, your main database or master database that's on the server, you're creating those profiles in there, and then that way each it's copied down and then each user can choose from those profiles. Any questions so far? Sorry, I didn't mute myself. We have a number of questions at this point. Are you, are you at the point where you want to take questions, or you have more to go still? Yeah, uh, we'll go through some questions, and I kind of have some uh, do's and don'ts, things that I've seen in support that kind of, um, again, I'll have a, a PowerPoint slide to show on that. And, so yeah, we can fill some questions. All right, I'll take one question out of order because it might add a little more to the presentation. There was a question here from Joe Truitt asking if you're going to talk about design line configurations. Design line configurations. Um, as far as design line goes, I mean, all of that information is stored in the service, which everything you see when I come to the service database, all this information is stored in the uh, service.map file. Now that's a good point. Now if you're using design line templates, this <laughs> this bit me before AU because I was doing a class on it. I came in here and I go to templates and I go to insert and there's none. Well, I know I created one. So I emailed Andy and Andy's like, no, it's not broke. Just well, at that time it was <laughs> It should have added it automatically, but it didn't. I think service packets fixed that. But if you're creating design line templates, you just want to make sure that I go to this design templates and I enable whatever design line templates I have in there. Now when I come into insert, you see I have the option to insert my design line template. Okay. All right, so let's go from the top of the list. We've got a number of good questions here. Would you, uh, Jason Delmuth asked, would you create project-specific configurations? Um, it depends, I guess. Profile, if you're just using, uh, by if you're meaning project-specific configurations for only services and things like that, I can create profiles uh, to create those job-specific um, services now uh, we have some users that you know all they do is detail they're, they're contracted out and so they'll have multiple um, contractors are working with that have multiple databases now something like that if you're doing work for another company my recommendation is to, if they can or will allow it send them your date their database you set it up uh, as its own configuration and you use that that way uh, everything should come over fine as far as the files and, and so forth. So there's some options there just depending on how you, what it is that you're making job specific. If it's only the services and then profiles is probably the best way. That way you're using all the same reports, it's using the same items, it's just pulling out that information for unique services. All right. Whoa. Hold on a second. I just clicked the wrong screen away. All right. Um, Newman Souza asks, he's got a scenario, one server and three computers with CamDuct. 
which folders should be in the server and which folders should be in each computer in order to share the database but keep the settings for each computer. Uh, in other words, printer information. Um, there's a really good topic on ExerCAD that shows the files that can be broken out separately. I'll be more than happy to show you what we've set up. Uh, you'll see here um, in CAM there is the you got this print 96 as well as let me see is it in here it gets created when you define your printer so this mis print pmd that is the file that uh, again gets created and so I can break that out for each user to have on their local machine so technically if I, if I look at how my configuration is set up this database location could be wherever I want and that's going to hold my items, reports, and, and so forth. And then this would be on everyone local machine with the INI &I and all these files broken out and this will allow each user to have their own um, unique files. Um, but again, if you want this to be standard across the board, throw this up on the server, that way they're pulling from the same information. But what's nice about this, like I said, I can each user can have their own spool line eye, their own printer settings. Um, and another thing on CAM, typically the CNC folder that will be pushed up in a shared location that the shop can pull from. So that's going to be pointed somewhere else too that each user would need to have in their I and I. This CNC location. So that should answer that one. All right. And you reminded me, too, when you mentioned ExtraCAD in regards to Jason's question about project-specific configurations, there's a great thread there as well on project-specific setup and using that tool. So you can read up on that if you want to search ExtraCAD for project-specific setup. Uh, let's see here. Scott Hoffman asking, selecting no to using an outside or third-party source will eliminate the database from being corrupt with unknown connectors and seams? That's a question he's asking. Is that the case? Correct. What By selecting no, I'm assuming you're referring to that prompt that when you're opening a file. By selecting no, it's going to bring that in, again, with bracketed information. But as soon as I close out of my database and close the drawing and CAD all together, it should not put that in. It should not inject that into my database. And on that note, is there a way to force Milton Hall's whole Hults, I think it is, or huts. I can't tell types real small, sorry. Is there a way to force a drawing to be recognized as being from your current configuration so that you don't always get the pop-up asking if you want to open the drawing, open with the drawing database? Yeah, I've I've ran into that and I don't understand, you know, I'll modify my database and I don't understand, sometimes it will prompt it, sometimes I don't see it, so I don't have an answer for that one. That's kind of, scra I've scratched my head on that one myself. Okay. Well, maybe we can throw it on to extra cat or talk to Andy. Um, Richard Davis asks, what's the difference between purge and delete permanent when using the purge database option? Delete permanent? Uh, these are the options we have here. Purge database and make permanent. So purge will delete it out. Make permanent will again uh, just make whatever I've told it permanent that's in parentheses uh, you'll see when I go into the main database dang it. I think when you said you could purge it you had two options you could either purge or delete everything isn't that what you said? Oh correct so let me, uh, let me do this let me open up that drawing to get something in there close it So, you know, if it's highlighted and I purge it, that's going to delete it, and then, of course, I can make it permanent. I'm assuming that's... So if you purge it or choose to delete it, instead of using that option, or in, instead of using the left option where it says purge database, if you chose to just delete it, there's really no difference? Oh, if I come in and delete it here. The problem is if I delete just the service, it's still it's going to leave behind all the you see here service spec uh, connectors things like that so 
whereas if I purge it versus deleting, it's grabbing anything that has, you'll see here, what it's affected areas that it's actually grabbing. Okay. So it's kind of a one way to get rid of all of that stuff that's tied to this user group .dwg. Not just how it was organized, but the actual parts and pieces too. All right. Correct. So um, this is kind of an open-ended question. Jason Delmuth asking, who do you suggest manages the administration of the database? So that's a, that is a good question. Um, and I'll give you kind of the, the perfect world scenario and the real life scenario, how it always seems to work. In a real world uh, perfect scenario, if you're running, let's just say you've got CAD, EST, and CAM, you've got one guy that has access on the CAD side to come in and create all your standards for CAD. Your CAM guy is going in there setting up his standards for the shop. Estimating is setting up all the costing information. Again, that's perfect real world, great, but typically how it is is you've got one guy that is doing all of that and or you've got a CAD department or department of three people and so how do I manage that? Um, Again, you, you want to limit the amount of people that have full access and full uh, editing purposes to the database. So uh, if you can, break it out to uh, maybe one or two two people. Again, especially on the shop standards, you're, of course, you're going to have to have a cam guy uh, either teach him how to do that and or sit down with him and make sure all that information is the same. Because really, I don't want my CAD guy setting up my shop standards as well as going in there and putting the costing. Uh, leave that to the people that know that stuff better, but again, that usually one person's wearing multiple hats in that scenario, so uh, you just got to sit down and communicate how we want to get that accomplished. Okay. The next question is, is there a combination of user permissions, or maybe the better way to say it is, is there a way to set up user permissions that allows a user to create or copy a service without giving them more permission to other database fields, so if they need to create a one-off, I'm assuming? What you see here in the configure users, uh, wait, hold on, open the wrong one. <clears throat> You know, what you see in here is, is are the options that we have. So I do have uh, edit services and sections. So, you know, I could take everything out and just put edit service and sections, and that will give whatever user I call for Fred just the ability that's all he can do. So the, the person that asked that said they use standard services that need to be updated periodically to ensure they stay unaltered. What's the best way or method to push those standard services without overriding locations, custom services? So how we how we ad address that with our configuration is um, again you you have we've broken it out to where we've got what we're calling a master database and a working database, and if anything needs to be changed, you hop into the master database, which is typically up on the server or in our case it's in Dropbox. Um, whether or not you're using our tool or something that you've created to uh, pull that information down. And all that's going to do is copy the information that's been changed. So if I modify that service, just tell them to, hey, update using whatever you're using, update your local database, and that way they'll get all those changes without change overriding um, you know, how we broke it out here. What this tool's doing is only updating these what's been uh, done to the database, it's not overriding their local settings. Okay. So that's one way to manage it. You got a shout out from him. Cool, thanks. Um, from Newman Souza, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Newman Souza asks, Autodesk website doesn't have a lot or much download content for HVAC, sheet metal, where else can I look for it? And on to that, I want to add uh, Felipe's question, which was, what major changes are in Inceptious database from previous versions? So maybe those two, I think, combined together pretty well. So the first one with the HVAC. Um, the, uh, really, the best thing to, I mean, that you would need in here, what we see is, of course, equipment, 
things because uh, there's always different lines of diffusers, VAVs, etc. Um, if we can get a file, we can convert that, you know, whether it's in a DWG format or even Revit at this time because we can bring that in and save it as an ITM file. Um, that's the best way probably to handle equipment and things like that uh, and or, you know, create a line and copy as needed. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, there's just not a whole lot on the uh, sheet metal side to go download ITM files, and I really don't see that changing anytime soon. Okay. So um, the data, the, the uh, I'm sorry, I want to call it ProPack. It's not the right name for it. Value, Value pack. pack. What's new in that? Anything specific you know of? Yeah, I can say, and what we've worked on here, and again, just try to keep this uh, as generic as possible. If you want more information, you can contact us on it. Um, but the biggest change is in 2016 uh, was unlocking the content. So what we've done is we've gone in and, and, and made sure that everything is, is set properly. Again, I mean, there may be some issues with some of the items, but Autodesk has done a good job of updating uh, and fixing what they have out there now. They have told us they are not creating content, they're not a content provider, they're in the business of making software. So what you see is what you get on the download content website, and we've taken that and just made sure that it's correct, as well as put all the Harrison codes and pricing uh, information on those items. Uh, we've worked with Harrison to update all of that data for the fabrication items. So um, again, if it's Harrison provides a code for it, more than likely we have it on our items. But right. again, if you, if you want more information on that, feel free to ask. Uh, I don't want to get into a sales pitch here. No, no problems. Um, <clears throat> earlier was asked which, when Newman Sousa asked which uh, files and folders go where, what we'll do, we'll just circle back with him on that and, and Clear, clarify that for him. Uh, a couple of people have said the sound is breaking up. I heard it too. Um, I checked with some others that are on this call, just so you know. I've always been bothered by that. It turns out it's my own connectivity. Everybody else was hearing it fine, so it's the receiver speed, just so everybody's aware of that. Um, let's see. Can you go over profiles one more time or just explain briefly what is a profile? So yeah, if I come into CAD MEP profiles, You'll see here I can, uh, I've got global, so global is going to be my everything that's in there. So I'm going to go to setup, select new, and then I can name this whatever I wish. And the important thing is here I want to copy, share the item files, uh, sections I'm going to keep unique so there's nothing to copy that. and. Select OK. Oh, wait, I forgot to do services. I'm sorry. I want to come in here and tell it, you know, whatever services that I want in that profile. Hit OK. Let me change that. User group. Uh, of course, got to love live demos. <laughs> what that should have done was just uh, say, let me go back to setup. No one knows unless they've done a demo. <laughs> Two shared items, select services. Even pushing to projector slows it down. See, it's not giving me the option to switch here. Uh, forgive me, I can circle back around on this. And uh, we've been asked this quite a bit, so probably the best thing is create a, a blog for it, and we'll get that out. I don't want to get stuck on here. I'm not. I'm missing a step or, or click here somewhere. But essentially, that should right. just give me the services in this list that I put in that profile. 
we've gotten through about two thirds of the questions, and and this is great because we got another about almost ten minutes left. So, um, is there a list somewhere? This is Joe Truitt asking. Is there a list somewhere of which files to copy for configurations? What files to copy for us to break? I'm assuming to break it out to make it unique for each user. I was guessing too. I don't know for sure. Um, I'm assuming that's what's being asked. We have a list. Whether or not, again, it's going to be based off each user. I would really recommend, and I can find the post on ExtraCAD. I should have done that. Uh, there's a really good conversation of uh, of users that will give you uh, more information on what you want to pull out and what you want to keep in depending on if you're tied to a shared database and so forth because again what my recommendation may be may not necessarily be what you're needing for that specific uh, out whatever you're, you're looking to do. If you're wanting to tie down the, the dimension and text files well then you'll leave the CAD info.mat file where it should be and then pull out the printer if you just want them to have each printer so again we can discuss that on each situation as needed. He said what you were assuming is correct, so that was what we were assuming, right? And Andrew, I think I'm going to pull Andrew's name out of the hat here today because he said here when you a minute ago when you weren't getting into work, he said you got a CAD MEP object in a drawing that's not letting you switch profiles. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I think I think we just found our our. Uh, Give, giveaway winner for today, so we'll give that to Andrew Smith for that. Nice catch. Um, if you're interested, or if you're sharing drawings with someone that doesn't have this add-on, add and I'm not sure which add-on maybe you recall, will the add-ons work on their CAD release? Uh, do you know what he means by add-on, or do we need to get specifics on that? Yeah, as far as, um, again, if, if they're not, if you're sending a drawing to someone that doesn't have your configuration, they're going to be limited into what is given to them. Okay. Or what they'll be able to modify and so forth. If you export services out, this is from Josh Merchant, if you export services out to clean up your services, the service template spec remains. Can these be deleted? Are they brought back in if you ever import back in a service? That's a good, good point. So when you export it out, that's kind of what I was showing. That when I delete a service, uh, wait. that information on the service templates will stay in here. So if I export that out, then what I need to do is come in here, if I want to clean it up, delete the service, and then when I come into my edit the service template, when I select this manage button, it'll give you a checkbox for any of those services that I have deleted. Now, that information, the service template, will be stored in the IEZ file. So if I've exported it out, I don't have to, if I delete it here, it's not a problem. I can bring it back by importing that IEZ file and it will bring in that information. Good. All right. And by the way, getting lots of feedback to, you know, thanks, yes, good, got it. Um, Nate Rigg asks, is there a way to open two sessions, Academy P, so you can work in a duct and in a pipe configuration at the same same time, he says it crashes when he tries. I can open up uh, two different instances, but if you're using the same file, uh, I wouldn't recommend that. Unfortunately, that same they've never. File. Yeah, unfortunately, that there's no easy way to. If you're trying, if you have to annotate both, and you have different annotation settings for duct and pipe, that's always been kind of, of a problem that we've ran into that there's no easy way to handle that, that I'm aware of, at least. Okay. Andrew Smith asks, is there a way to export sections? I want all users to be able to create job sections and then send them back to the master database so they're not lost when updating. Yes, let me see. Manage, where's my manage database button? Export, database export. You'll notice that I have the option to export out my sections. So this is not, and this is a good point, I haven't even touched on this yet. Uh, this database export, you'll see here everything I have access to export out. So I can grab multiple things at once, and what this is going to create, it's not an IEZ file, it is a, 
Um, let's just see here. IOX file. So yes, I can pull out my service or my sections and import those in and send those to anybody or whatever I need to do. So yeah, if I've created that locally and I want to push it back up to the server or that master database, um, I can do so easily. All right, perfect. And in response to that last question, the one about opening two sessions at once, Milton Holtz added that he opens up two different databases and works on pipe and duct drawings all the time. So he thought if it's crashing, it may be his computer's hardware not being able to handle it. So that would be a good discussion to start on, on ExtraCAD, oh, you know, guys go back and forth maybe. That, and that's a good point too. I've been running into some of some of the same issues it seems like lately on 2016 and file size, and this may be unrelated to that question, but if you're crashing, my first thing to always check, and it's kind of my rule of thumb if you call me and say you're having these type of issues, uh, always make sure so you've got AutoCAD. If I look at the About Autodesk AutoCAD, make sure uh, right now it's 2016, there's only one service pack, but if you don't see SP1 there, that means you don't have the service pack installed. The very first release of the 2016 uh, CAD MEP and AutoCAD were very unstable. Um, and now if I go to my application manager, you'll see in here I have access to all of the service packs. So just make sure that you're checking this periodically and uh, making sure you have all the service packs installed. All right. And we're down to the last question. And <clears throat> Before we do that, Andrew Andrew Smith, um, we picked you for the giveaway. Nice catch in there. Uh, if you're still on, just type the word "congratulations" into the chat box, and we'll uh, get we'll circle back with you after the webcast to uh, get your information and send you your gift card. Got it. Thank you. Um, last question is: How does the database button tie into the map file? Database button tie into the map file. I'm assuming that this master database button, and I don't. There's multiple map files, so. Um, he says, "Yeah, that's what he's talking about." So, you'll notice that when I come into the database, I've got all the you know service dot map, material dot map, connector dot map. So again, whenever I'm modifying something in the database, whatever part of it uh, that I'm in, it's literally everything that's in this database. So this is kind of where it, it's, you, you got to be careful what you pull from this data, these map files. I can't just come in here and just start grabbing things and set them somewhere um, because you'll, when I'm in the database, it's modifying and uh, multiple files at once. And so you just got to be careful and understand that. And usually, you know, if you crash while you're in the main database, Sometimes it will corrupt these files, so again, make sure you back up, back up, back up. All right. Well, that exhausts our questions, and we are one minute to go, so this is perfect timing. So again, congratulations to Andrew Smith. I got your chat response, so you're good to go. And um, I just want to tell everybody, thank you very much for joining us. We really had a great time. Uh, feel free to always contact us if you've got problems, questions, whatever the case may be. Um, but uh, I think this was a great webcast, Lyle. I think uh, this really gave everybody a lot of information they needed to hear. All right, so with that, uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your week, Friday, tomorrow, and the weekend coming up soon, and thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Lyle. Thanks. Thank you.